Salaby and welcome to the Business of Life. We're talking fashion and we're going to start the conversation on a serious note. Fashion often feels like a light subject, but it's a big business with a dark side. So how do you make the right decisions about what to buy for yourself and the rest of the world? Tonight we're going to find out and as always we'll break down the issues in facts, figures, dollars and cents. I'm joined by a panel of uniquely qualified experts eager to answer this question. What is the business of fashion? Let's take a look at this first stat. 5,283 gallons. That's how much water it takes to make just one t-shirt and one pair of jeans. And if that sounds like a lot, that's because it is. It takes just 70 gallons of water to take a bath. Jenna, why does it take so much water to kind of make those products? Well, a lot of things go into that statistic. Cotton is a hugely water-intensive crop. Textile manufacturing takes a lot of water. There's a lot of chemicals in it that uh, themselves require sensitivity in how they're handled uh, so that they don't seep into the groundwater. However, a lot of textile manufacturing takes place in countries that don't have very strong environmental or labor standards. Matthew, can we just set the terms for a second? What do you mean by fast fashion? Fast fashion, um, you'll see a trend on the runway and then two weeks later, it's in your local um, fast fashion store. At an H &M, affordable GSRs, price. your 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 um, Forever 21. Mm -hmm. Those are stores that everyone can go into. They're very democratic. Um, however, um, they don't use the most ethical practices when it comes to producing those clothing. So there is an impact. So you do have to think and be aware of what you're buying and how it got there. You'll see clothing that is branded and tagged, made in America, made in USA. You know that it was made here in the United States from, from start to finish. Um, otherwise, if you can just look inside of your jeans, your shirts, and the tags and see exactly where it's made and where it came from. That's a great point. Can I quickly ask everyone here, how many of you do actually do that? How many of you look inside your clothes to see where it was made before you buy the item? Quick show of hands. Hmm. Wow. About half the audience. I have to admit, I'm being a little bit skeptical. Like, <laughs> isn't you, well, that's, honestly, that's because, when you, because <laughs> when you go shopping, isn't your driving first thought, is this going to look good on me? Right. I have to be honest, I think everybody was being a little bit politically correct. I, I really don't believe a lot of people check the label of, of the distribution point and, and yeah. the manufacturing point before they purchase something. I have watched the whole sort of sustainability happen in the world of fashion and things being green and people really pushing that movement. But everything that was green was 30 to 45% more expensive. And I can tell you, nobody bought it. You might be surprised to learn how much Americans spend on their clothes. $1,141. That's the amount the typical American spends every year on a apparel, which breaks down to 64 garments and eight pairs of shoes. Matthew, if you do the maths on that, that works out at less than $20 per item. That seems crazy. Very crazy. Which means that, you know, if those items are $20 each, they're not being made in a safe and ethical place. Right. And eight pairs of shoes. Does anyone need eight new pairs of shoes every year? Depending on the person, <laughs> yes. Depending on the person. Who is the person that needs eight pairs of shoes? You know, if, you're, if you're working in the business of fashion, I think that you do change out your wardrobe quite often. You, you know, you buy things, you sell things, you give things away. I don't think that the fashion industry uh, exists to correspond to actual need. Um, it's not an industry that intends to address need. It's an industry that exists to stoke desire and to make money to profit off of that desire. So how can people make sure that they're getting good value for money? That means clothes that are relatively cheap but good quality. Well, I mean, I think that's, that's going to be relative. I mean, I but expensive it. clothes aren't always great quality either, right? No, and, that, that, yeah. and, that, and my justification is in saying that just because you buy a designer brand, you are getting better made things. And a lot of cross manufacturing happens in a lot of these foreign factories. So overall, if you had to choose between buying cheap or buying expensive, what would you say? I think it, for personally, I mean, I can only speak for myself. I think it really depends on the item. Right, well, let's hear from the audience. Are there any questions for the panel? Yeah, hey. Hi, my name is Chelsea. Hey, I just Chelsea. wanted to know how could I could save money and also be fashionable? Because I noticed that a lot of stylish clothes is very expensive. Pinpoint the things that you like, right. the brands that you like, uh, the fabrics that you like, and then track those things. Wait for them to go on sale. Don't buy four pairs of jeans for $20 from a lower price store. Wait and get that one pair that you really want for $100. At least you'll know then it's the thing that you want. And nine times out of 10, mm -hmm. hopefully, if it's more expensive, it's better quality and it's made in a better place. Good point. Let's go to a stat. $120. That's the price of Kanye West's hip hop t-shirt collaboration with APC. Fans who bought it, and you know who you are, paid 120 bucks for a white Egyptian cotton jersey with APC Kanye silk screened inside the neckline. Joe, how does he get away with that? <laughs> He's Kanye West. I mean, look, the reality is 
that's what fashion is always about. It's about interpretation. And like, that's an example. But I used to say the example that you could buy a Hanes t-shirt for $11, or you could buy a Gucci white t-shirt for $500. And there is always a market for that because somebody out there bought it or yes. they wouldn't have made it. But are those people that are buying it idiots, for want of a better word? Are they just getting conned? No, I mean, it's a big part of the business. I mean, these artists are out there. Of course, they're working hard with their music and everything like that. And they're making even more money by incorporating fashion into their businesses now. And if their fans want to take part of it, I mean, they should. And I also think it's a very different customer, I have to be honest. Like, I think the person buying an $11 Hanes t-shirt at a local Kmart is going to be a very different person than the one who buys a Kanye t-shirt or a Gucci t-shirt. And they probably don't care about Kanye West, so. And they're not targeting the same people. It might be a different person, but it's kind of the same product. So aren't they still kind of getting conned, right? Yeah. Sometimes the quality is very different, okay. you know? I mean, I mean how much can the quality be different for a $109 your, your dish? Oh, I mean, I think if you strip it down, yes, it is the same thing. But it is you the know, same no product, different yeah. than going to KFC and getting fried chicken there versus going to Marcus Samuelson restaurant and getting fried chicken there. I mean, I think the reality is like you, you pay for the branding, you pay for the thing behind it, but in essence, they're both fried chicken. When you're buying a $120 t-shirt from APC, uh, you are subsidizing, in addition to the, the branding differences and uh, the percentage of that sale that's going to Kanye, you're also subsidizing uh, a retail footprint. You're so, uh, probably in an expensive area of town. It's probably a, a fancy boutique. Right, um, but then this is what kind of bothers me, right? Yeah. Kanye West fans don't necessarily live in an expensive part of town. A lot of his yeah. fans are people on relatively low incomes who are gonna aspire to buy that T-shirt but can't. Isn't that a little bit unethical? Logically, <laughs> no, no, I don't want to no, but seriously, it's all well and good saying that's just high fashion. But when the people that are really, really struggling to buy those items actually can't really afford them. But in the end, it's all aspirational. And I mean, if, if, it, if buying the t-shirt makes them feel a little bit more connected to somebody that they idolize, you know, they appreciate what he does, love his artistry, I think that, you know, it should be okay. If they're working for it and they're being honest about it, they should be able to buy what they want. Lots of young people find out about style where else but on the internet. Look at this statistic. Over 920,000. That's the number of likes and comments on just 51 Instagram posts by Tommy Hilfiger from the 2016 Fall New York Fashion Week. Joe, how is social media changing fashion? Oh, it's completely changed fashion. I mean, I think it's allowed everybody to be part of the conversation. Mm -hmm. So if you like that look from Tommy Hilfiger, you just have to double tap, and that says to me, like, you validated that. And I think that says to the designer, oh, we're gonna do more of this, we're gonna do more of that. You're actually influencing them. They can say, oh, like, it was these people in this area from this demographic, and it does inform some of what they're making, right? They can do that, yes. They can get very strategic with the analytics, but also, at the same time, you really can't pinpoint exactly what people are gonna buy. And what do they do with those analytics then? They track and see which parts of the world are interested. I mean, having been in a lot of these marketing meetings that deal with artists and, and celebrities and fashion, they, they do track it. And the positive side of all of this social media is that where once things were kind of ruled by a couple of magazines like Vogue and Harper's Bazaar, social media is kind of democracy in action, isn't it? Uh, I think it can be, yeah. Uh, fa social media offers uh, many more points of entry than the traditional sort of fashion system, which mm -hmm. was a lot more closed uh, and a lot more restrictive. Yeah, let's see if we have any other questions from the audience. Yeah, over here. Hi, my name's Rashida. Um, my question is, so as someone who loves fashion mm -hmm. and clothes... You look great. <laughs> <laughs> um, how do I figure out who to follow on social media and who to not follow? I would say, you know, look for people that kind of like look like you. Mm -hmm. Their style resonates with, you know, and there's always hidden messaging behind everything, but I think you can see past all those veiled things. But again, like just look for someone that you can say, I would wear that. Yeah. Let's take another question from the audience. Hi, I'm Sandra. Hey, Sandra. Um, I want to look good. I just sometimes feel torn. How do I not make mistakes in, when I pick out my clothes? I built an entire career on mistakes. I think that's what yeah. fashion is. I think the things that you make a mistake, <laughs> like you take a chance, you try things. Mm -hmm. Because if you just follow the bunch, then nothing ever gets, nothing ever moves forward. The beauty is in the mistake. You have yeah. to try things out and I find agree. what works. I agree too. Yeah. yeah. This will end there. I think we all agree. That seems like a good point to end the show. So that does it for this edition of The Business of Life. I'd like to thank Jenna, Joe, Matthew, and all of you for joining us. We'll see you next time on The Business of Life. Bye-bye. Business of Life is made possible by Better Money Habits. It's a free resource that helps you build practical knowledge and take control of your finances. Powered by Bank of America. See more at BetterMoneyHabits.com.